Fool's Day. And I, for one, am so very thankful for the beautiful souls that remind us that this world is not binary. Yes or no, black or white, you're in or you're out. Reminding us that we have the agency to create a path for ourselves. Reminding us that language is ours for reclaiming. Reminding us that there's beauty in and throughout everything. I send out all my love to my non-binary friends and family and a special shout out to my two spirit indigenous friends and fam. What leaving a binary theology did for me was helped me press into my own innate curiosity about how the world and even our own existence works because naturally I'm an inquisitive person. So I enjoy the questions sometimes more than the answers. Actually, I I think I enjoy the process of researching more than any of it. Life is so interesting though, right? Like, do you believe in a parallel existence? I think I kind of do. Like, if so, are you the spin-off version? Or are you the, the lead, I guess? I've made some pretty drastic decisions in uh, my life. And I guess in this reality, that makes me feel like perhaps I'm the spin-off version and not the lead. But I was talking with Adam about this and he was like, you know, one of the big decisions I made was like dating him and breaking up with my ex and <laughs> falling in love with him. And um, that's a whole thing for a whole nother day. But basically he was like, well, don't you think that the lead would be the one where you followed your heart and where, you know, love was the lead, which I guess that's true. Anyway, and there's also parts of me that believes in like a reincarnation. Um, period, but also the reincarnation of energy. Because I feel so deeply guided by my ancestors, but I also have this uh, innate feeling of being one with them, in particular some specific ancestors of mine. Um, so anyway, it's just another interesting thing about life to think about. And like, what's deja vu? What's dreams? What really is reality? What do we actually know? <laughs> um, I love this stuff. The meaning of life and vibrational energy and auras and chakras and different dimensions. This is the stuff I live for. So on one hand, I really believe all this stuff. Um, and then on the other hand, I, I think pretty much I just, at some point get kind of done or burnt out or like over the conversation. And so I just end up being like, well, I I could land on the idea that we're just worm food. <laughs> like when we die, nothing happens, which is also an option. But I think that's why I like these kind of conversations because the answer for me is always yes. If you come up with an idea or we're just having conversation about afterlife and all this, I'll pretty much jump on the bandwagon that you're on because it's just so interesting for me to to go there with someone. And I don't think I could have fully leaned into this side of myself, this part that means so much to me, if I couldn't leave a binary mindset behind. Another way I've grown and evolved is obviously my perspective of God. Exploring who owns God. Like who gets to determine who or what God is. And of course my experiences, my own life experiences have defined that for me, have kind of shaped that for me, but so does everyone else's. And as you can imagine, I have also enjoyed deconstructing those experiences and perspectives and narratives. And I, and I like to see if what I have believed genuinely fits my perspective and my idea of who God is. And it makes me think about the way we talk about God, the way we talk to God, the way we worship or commune with the divine. And I gotta be honest with you, I don't think Christian music is for God. I think Christian music is for people who think they own God. And I know that's an inflammatory statement, but what I mean is it's people singing about the God box that they created, reinforcing their control of how God is perceived and meditating over their own perception of who or what God is, which is our human right and can be healing and productive. However, it becomes problematic when nobody is allowed to imagine or reimagine or have a different perspective of who or what God is and that is what makes the Christian God so small. I haven't officially written a worship song 
um, since deconstructing, maybe bits and pieces, but not like a full thing. I want to, but part of what I love about music is the collaboration part. And I'll be frank, it's, it's hard to find people who want to write Christian music and write deconstructed Christian music or progressive Christian music or inclusive Christian music or however you want to call it. So it's weird. And so I've, I've kind of returned to worship. I stepped away from worship music for, for a second, for a little bit, <laughs> trying to find my footing and uh, language. And I don't, I don't listen as much as I used to listen because honestly, there are some songs and moments that just make me feel really, really sad. Cause I, I do miss worship. I, I miss corporate worship a lot. But I also now know a lot of the the songwriters and the bands and singers uh, behind the songs or on the songs. Um, and I know their stance on some really important issues and it honestly makes me cringe. And that's, a, that's really an insider burden, to be honest. <laughs> but the good thing is, I believe we have the agency to relanguage songs or lyrics. Relanguaging them in a way that honors self and honors, you know, your or my perspective of God and life. Retraining your mind, but or, or just yourself to hear and sing lyrics differently, like. The old lyric would be, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Relanguaging that to, I don't have to earn it because I deserve it. Meaning God's love, by the way. And hopefully I'll be writing music again here soon. But right now, sometimes I just let myself feel sad. And that's just the God honest truth. But not only have I deconstructed my views of God and worship, the meaning of life. But I've also begun the healing process of reconstructing. Not in a way that means that I have landed, far from that actually. But I've begun to use language that honors my relationship with the divine and reclaiming my spirituality as it relates to my heritage and my ancestors. Essentially, my deconstruction, which is continual and a breaking down led to my decolonization, which is continual and healing, which then is finally leading me to reconstruction, which is again, continual, but a building up. And like I said, I haven't arrived. I don't think that can really happen on this side of things, AKA this life, this reality, but I am beginning the process of, well, what now? As you can imagine, the, deconstructing and reconstructing really does take a toll on your emotional and mental state and your mental health. And at times it's left me grasping for stability and the need to be grounded. Lately, Adam and Patchouli and I have been going on these sunset walks. We've been making it a part of our routine. Right around eight or just before eight, the sky turns like this cotton candy color which is like my favorite. And we take a little stroll around the neighborhood. It gives me like this sense of control as you know, we all transition from day to night. Our walks are somewhat meditative and help me remember that life isn't happening to or at me. And it reminds me that I am an active part in this world and I have power over my life. If you've been feeling overwhelmed and feeling like life is just going so fast around you, happening so fast around you, or sometimes it feels like it's going on without you altogether, I honestly would recommend sunset strolls. It's not a perfect remedy, but it is a good step in a healing direction. I mean, it's free nature therapy. And at the very least, it is a healthy coping mechanism to implement into your routine. It is for me anyway. It's actually about that time now, so I gotta hop off and go enjoy this time. Thanks for listening, guys. Until next time.